Greetings, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, as we call it. And I want to welcome you to the webinar, Promising Practices Spotlight, partnering to provide direct client services with our presenters from Kentucky, Missouri, Rhode Island, and one from the APS TARC as well. And I'll introduce them here shortly. Uh, next slide. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit of information. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings and uh, points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Uh, next slide. Uh, a little bit about the APS TARC, if you're not familiar with us or not too terribly familiar with us. The mission, uh, our mission is to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies, and providing individualized technical assistance to APS programs. We're basically here to help you in any way that we can. Just reach out to us and we'll have our contact information uh, on a slide at the end. Next slide. Please join us each month for Let's Talk APS, our monthly peer support discussion. We host two uh, informal collaborative peer calls each month. One is centered around practice to discuss training, investigation, care planning, and that's the third Wednesday of every month at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific time. We also have a program management or policy kind of oriented call to discuss policy and programmatic issues. That's the fourth Wednesday of every month from at, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time, 12 p.m. Pacific time. And if you're interested in joining either of these calls, just reach out to us at the contact information displayed at the end of the webinar. We'll make sure you have the information to join. Next slide. Uh, another quick reminder that the National Adult Protective Services Training Center, or the NATC, uh, has been launched. And there's uh, no cost APS core program e-learning courses available on it uh, to any APS professional across the country. Uh, please visit the website on the slide for additional information. These are really great courses. We're very excited here at the APS TARC that this is finally launched. So do check it out if you haven't um, checked out the NATC yet. Next slide. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping um, regarding handouts. They're in the handout section of your webinar control panel. Um, you'll find today's slides there. You may download these at any time during the webinar. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Please make sure the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. And if you experience any audio or video problems during the presentation, what we recommend is closing out the webinar software and then rejoining with the link that came to you via email. We have some limited ability to troubleshoot, so you're welcome to ask questions. That usually fixes things by closing out of the webinar and then just coming right back in. Uh, next slide. You may ask questions, share comments by typing them in the questions slash chat box at any time during the webinar. We will relay your questions um, or as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the webinar. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the TARC website at a later date. We'll notify all the registrants when um, that uh, posting is, is uh, when that recording is posted online on our website. We'll make sure you get a message about that. And then everyone attending today will receive an email in about 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. Also, just lastly, be sure to complete the brief evaluation that pops up um, when the webinar is complete today. We'd like to hear your feedback. Next slide. So I'm gonna launch a quick poll just to get a sense of who the audience is today. And I will launch that right now. The question is, what profession do you identify most closely with? Is it adult protective services? Are you a medical professional, a legal professional? Are you research academic? Or do you consider yourself other social services? We'll leave this poll open just for a couple minutes so folks have a chance to fill it out. And I think we'll leave it open for just a couple more minutes. Most of our folks have voted already. All right, I think I'm going to close the poll and I will share the results with everybody. You are over, overwhelmingly adult protective services professionals at 71%. We have a few medical and legal uh, research academic folks and then about 21% are uh, other social services. So thanks so much for, um, for taking that poll for us. We appreciate it. It helps us get an idea of who's attending today. 
Next slide. Um, before we hear from our panelists, uh, next slide, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer Kirchen. Um, Jennifer Kirchen is with the APS TARC and knows a lot about um, uh, all the formula grants that the states have been working on. She's going to lay the groundwork for us a little bit. So, Jennifer, I'll leave it over, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to lay kind of a foundation today uh, to talk about the um, innovation grants that uh, our three panelists are going to talk about. So, if we talk about the history of APS funding, it dates back to 2010 when the Elder Justice Act passed. And with that came some formula grants um, along with some demonstrations, but no appropriations for formula grant funding at that point. Um, and then beginning in 2015, um, there were um, 11 states that were awarded grants. And then you can see um, all the way through 2020. Um, so a total of 50 awards in 32 states. And this includes some states such as Massachusetts that has a bifurcated system. Um, kind of fast forwarding to 2020, we've got SIRSA and ARPA that were passed and allocated to the states. Um, they were first distributed in August of 21 and 22. And states had states and territories had um, some targeted improvement areas uh, that they wanted to focus on according to their operational plans. And you can see um, that 45 states or territories, APS programs, identified goods and services as target improvement areas. When we talk about goods and services, um, the overwhelming sub-detail is wraparound services. And if we drill down a level for goods and services, um, 33 APS programs identify gaps in their programs and use ARPA funds for wraparound services. And parameters for utilizing these services um, were that they needed to improve or enhance their APS system at the state or local level. So let's define wraparound services before we hear how some states have used these funds. So wraparound services um, can be defined a little bit differently depending on the jurisdiction that you find yourself in. So each APS program may define it just a slightly differently, but for the purposes of this webinar today, we'll be using this definition. Um, wraparound services are a safety net of services to support clients in areas necessary to maintain independence in the least restrictive setting while promoting self-determination. And prior to ARPA funds, um, many APS programs didn't have a budget to access um, any sort of funds to provide wraparound services. They had to rely solely on community resources um, and depending on the jurisdiction, uh, rural areas really had to rely on other avenues. Um, some examples of wraparound services might include emergency shelter or housing, um, housing cleanup services such as hoarding cleanup, transportation, um, emergency food, um, PPE. So lots of uh, folks didn't have PPE, at least at the start of the pandemic. Um, and then utility uses, uh, shutoffs, replacements, repairs to air conditioning, furnaces, hot water heaters, et cetera. So um, kind of a broad definition, and this is just a few examples. There are some other examples that states consider uh, falling in that bucket. So I'm gonna turn it back to Andy for the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for uh, setting the stage for us and giving us all that information. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. We have Cliff Bryant. He's the APS Administrator for Kentucky at the Kentucky Department of Community-Based Services. We also have Tim Jackson. He's the APS Administrator for the State of Missouri at the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, and also Mary Ladd. Um, she's the APS Administrator for Rhode Island at the Rhode Island Office of Healthy Aging. I think we're very fortunate to have all of these panelists with us today, they're all extremely knowledgeable um, about what they're gonna speak about. So um, I'd like to say welcome to all of them. Um, we'll go to our first question on the next slide. So 
So our first question for our panelists is, why did you prioritize client services for your new funding? Again, why did you prioritize client services for your new funding? And I think first we're gonna hear from Cliff. Hello. Uh, in Kentucky, we decided to prioritize our fundings. We set aside a huge amount of money for this just because we have absolutely no funding stream in Kentucky prior to um, COVID money. Um, we also know that the majority of people have an extremely hard time focusing on the safety and risk factors that are identified when there are some things going on that could be taken care of, um, such as infestations, um, damage to the home, um, lack of caregivers. So we were trying to alleviate as much as we could possibly alleviate so they could get back on to the focus of how do I stay safe in my home? How do I reduce as much risk as possible when it comes to abuse, neglect, and exploitation? And we also identified that there is a a lack of community partners that had funding available at the time as well. Um, so we couldn't even rely on the people that we used to rely on because um, things are just so tight these days that this was something that was much needed. Thanks so much, Cliff. I think next we will hear from uh, Mary Ladd in Rhode Island. Hi, thank you. Um, so we too, um, in Rhode Island had very limited funding for our APS clients for direct services. Um, <clears throat> we have an investigation uh, unit here at, at uh, the Office of Healthy Aging, but we also contract with case management agencies to provide our like direct services for case management. So what we did is we um, got together with all our case management agencies and community partners and said, what are you guys seeing out there where are the gaps? How can we take some of this funding and use the funding to on um, to enhance our client services? What what's needed? So we came up with a list of things. We kind of whittled it down a little bit. On um, and on um, when we decided uh, certain things that we were going to use the funding for. We contracted with our case management agencies. We did an amendment to their contract for adult protective services, and we gave them this funding and said, you must use this funding strictly for um, client direct services. So um, we used it for such things as um, short-term hotel and motel stays, um, transportation, food security, short-term utility assistance, uh, housekeeping, um, like doing like either like some light housekeeping or some major housekeeping, um, cleaning supplies, some enhancement to any services that they were receiving in the community, such as adult daycare or home care, and moving costs. So um, we gave it straight to our case managers, uh, to their agencies, and they are sort of our first responders on for case management of protective services. So they were actually out there seeing what these folks needed on um, and then through the um, through our processes of of on um, paying for the for the services, they were able to give these services directly to our APS clients. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. I think next we'll hear from Tim. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so the the main reason that we prioritize client services with our funding um, is because there are gaps in the availability of community resources for clients. I'm sure that uh, comes to no surprise for, for anyone that's worked in adult protective services for any uh, length of time. So this, uh, we really focused on unfundable or unfunded resources. Uh, so this lack of resources or insufficient resources for certain needed interventions results in our APS staff having to put band-aids on situations rather than being able to, you know, really address the root causes of the client's risk. The availability of the funds gave us the opportunity to have a lasting impact on our client situations uh, by addressing root causes for those impacted by self-neglect or other forms of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. This allows us to implement a person-centered, holistic plan to help the client reduce his or her level of risk. 
The second reason we did what we did was for the immediacy of impact. We were looking for a simple way of getting funds into the hands of needy APS clients to quickly improve their quality of life. We saw the AAAs as the perfect partners to help deliver this program because of their role as the research, or I'm sorry, resource experts and their statewide coverage. And so far it has proven to be an effective uh, partnership between Missouri APS and Missouri's 10 AAA agencies. Um, and finally, and, and I'm sure this is the same for, for uh, the other panelists on this call, but we just felt that it was the right thing to do to prioritize client services with the federal funding we received. So we devoted more than a half of our, more than half of our coronavirus response and relief funds towards our, our direct services program. And we also devoted a significant share of our American Rescue Plan Act funds to it as well, to the continuation of it. And it doesn't just impact our clients or make their lives easier. It makes our APS specialists happy because they're able to come closer to meeting their clients' needs. So it makes their job a little bit easier. So those are just a few of the reasons we prioritize client services with our funding. Oh, Andy, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, folks. I think uh, what I was saying was, I think almost anybody in APS would applaud making it easier um, for, for APS case managers because it's, it's not a simple job in any way, shape, or form. One question I'll ask the panelists real quick before we move on to the next question. Were there any time limits set up on how long you can provide these services or is it just kind of a case-by-case -case basis? Do you decide, you know, for each case, how long you provide the services or is there like a hard and fast rule set in policy about um, how long you actually provide certain services? And that goes for anybody on the panel. We've given our, our um, and I'll talk a little bit about the process of how it works a little bit here in a minute, but we've sure. given our AAA staff um, uh, 45 days to complete that engagement with that client. Um, but of course, we're being very flexible with them um, to uh, get the needs met for that client. Sometimes it takes a little longer than that for a home modification or, or something extensive. So we're fairly sure. flexible. Uh, yeah, so on um, having a time limit on things or, or putting a cap on certain things, we were a little bit like we were kind of lax about that. Obviously, they had to use their best judgment. Um, out in the community, our case management agencies usually hold cases open for up to 60 days, maybe longer. So um, it, the service would have to, have to be completed within the 60 days. Um, because the client has to be an active APS client in, in, all, in order to receive these services. Thanks, Mary. And we set up the, a similar system where they have to be an APS um, client in order to receive the funding. Um, so there is always the option that we could pay for the services ahead of time if it was going to be a long term. And we have done that in the past if we knew exactly, like, say, how many um, days of services, we would just be billed ahead of time, so it would be taken sure. care of. I know at least one of you mentioned the term Band-Aid on services, so that made me think of the, the question about time, so and I know you may address that in the next question as well. So I think we can move on to the next question. Um, next slide. Um, please describe your model for providing client services, so maybe a little more detail about the services that you provide, and I think we're going to start with Mary. Great. So um, once again, I am from Rhode Island. I work for the Rhode Island Office of Healthy Aging. We are the state unit on aging here in Rhode Island. We do not have AAAs in Rhode Island. Um, we are a, a population of about a little over a million people in Rhode Island. And about one of every, every five of those um, persons is an adult over the age of 65. So we do have a large population of older adults here in Rhode Island. We are the state unit on aging. We are mandated by Rhode Island law to receive and respond to, um, to reports of abuse, neglect, financial exploitation, and self-neglect. And our client base is, um, our clients are, must be age 16 over per Rhode Island law. So we are an investigative unit. That is our um, legal mandate. We are a unit of 11. We have five investigators that cover the entire state. Um, we also receive all the, all the intakes. We screen all the intakes. 
If they are abuse cases, they are assigned to our investigators here internally. But as I said previously, because we don't have any AAAs, we contract with community action agencies, with community agencies that provide our adult protective services. They are also the first responders for self-neglect. So if we receive a case and it's screened in as self-neglect, it's referred to our case management agency. Um, and if we do an investigation, either during the investigation or at the, at the uh, completion of an investigation, if the, um, the client needs or requires or requests services in the community, we refer that case also to the case management agency. They pick it up there and they're the ones who are responsible for the assessment, for the care planning. They're the ones who can access the funds for our goods and resources. And as I said before, um, they have up to 60 days in most cases to um, complete their case, um, make the necessary uh, referrals, and get the resources for the adult protective service client. Great, thank you, Mary. Um, Tim, I think we'll hear from you next. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so uh, just to kind of contrast uh, Missouri with Rhode Island, um, we are a uh, we deal with um, folks 18 and up, so 18 to 59 with any kind of disability or 60 and above. Um, uh, and and so uh, the way that our direct services program works, this um, program that we have to kind of meet. Uh, the unmet needs of our clients is first off, you know, our Missouri uh, State APS staff, they receive the reports of abuse, neglect, and exploitation like they normally would. They complete an assessment of the client's uh, level of risk and their needs while they're also simultaneously trying to determine uh, whether there is potentially a crime involved. Um, Missouri APS staff addresses the needs that can be addressed so they uh, so they look for available community resources and link the clients up with those available community, community resources. But they're also identifying other interventions uh, that the client needs for which there is no funding or there, or there are no resources in place. So once the APS staff has determined that interventions are needed for which there is no funding, they refer the client to the network of AAAs through an online system uh, that we have called the Cumulus. Cumulus routes the referral to the appropriate AAA based on the location of the APS client. So if they're in Sykeston, Missouri, which is where I'm located, uh, if a referral is made, then it makes its way to Aging Matters, the AAA that covers Southeast Missouri. Um, so triple, the AAA staff um, or their subcontractors, they then engage with the APS client to provide case management and to coordinate setting up any services or goods that are needed for that individual. Um, the, um, our APS staff uh, gives them a plan for what the basic needs that they feel like are, but if additional needs are identified by AAA staff, the AAA uh, staff seeks approval from APS to provide the, the additional interventions if they're deemed necessary. And once all the services are delivered or the goods are obtained, um, the AAA staff completes a satisfaction survey with the client. Um, they report the outcomes of their case actions to APS via that cumulus system. And then they invoice our department uh, to be reimbursed for the expenses that they were out. So uh, just the quick and uh, cliff, cliff note versions of that. Basically our staff, our APS staff, meet with the client, assess them, determine what their needs are. If there are needs that can't be met um, because there are, uh, there are no uh, available community resources, they refer the client to the AAAs. The AAA then works with that client to link them up with those, uh, those goods, services, whatever the intervention is needed. Um, and uh, they purchase those goods or services for the person. Uh, and then they turn around and they invoice the, our department to be reimbursed for them. So that's the uh, quick and dirty version of how that works. So some of the different types of services that we provided, and, and Jennifer did a great job of ticking through wraparound services because uh, that's, that's basically what uh, is our, our list is made up of. So caregiver services, either personal care, homemaker, 
respite, uh, nursing services, all on a short-term basis until a long-term plan can be established or uh, another funding source like Medicaid can be put into place. Um, environmental cleanup, like deep cleaning or trash removal. Um, uh, Jennifer mentioned those hoarder situations that we run into uh, quite often. Um, and this environmental cleanup can, can help with that. Connected to that is pest control, um, uh, treating infestations of roaches, um, bed bugs, uh, different uh, kind of vermin that we're all, that all make us all itch a little bit. Um, we, we uh, in Missouri, and I, I know we're not uh, uh, unique in this um, issue, but we have several cases of bed bugs uh, constantly around the state. Our, our clients seem to always have uh, challenges with bed bugs. So uh, trying to find a, a, a contractor that will, um, you know, do that um, treatment um, at a reasonable price is not that easy. As, as many of you all probably know. Um, other forms of uh, assistance that we provide are financial assistance with housing, rent, uh, utilities. Um, I, I also, I already mentioned home modifications and repairs, anything to basically make their home safer uh, for them to be able to remain uh, in and, and potentially divert, divert nursing facility placement. Um, supplies and medical care supplies like groceries, cleaning supplies, personal uh, product or personal hygiene products and uh, medical equipment not covered by insurance. Um, some nutrition assistance, again, on a short-term basis for delivered meals um, or congregate uh, meals until a, a longer-term funding source can be established and uh, transportation. And so those are, so those are some of the different usages that we, we have for our program. So turn it over to Cliff next. Thanks, Tim. That's really comprehensive. Great to hear. Cliff? So in Kentucky, we also serve um, what we consider vulnerable adults, um, 18 and over. And we also have what's called a general adult services referral, which is basically just a true social services assessment of that clientele in addition to um, those 60 and over that want services from us as well. Um, so with our service, we set up a contract with our community action agency. We selected one in the state to handle all of the money and we just made that contract with them specifically. We are very fortunate that our contracts tend to go a little bit quicker in Kentucky, especially when all of the funds come from the federal government as opposed to the state. Our legislature still reviews those, um, but they are less they are not reviewed as extensively when it is just federal money. So it moves things along pretty quickly. Um, so once we do an investigation or an assessment, um, the worker is supposed to work through the social services aspects of it and making sure that um, they are reaching out to any kind of community partners or um, service providers, um, churches, anybody who may have some funds available to help pay for any of the needs because that's what we were doing before we continued that path um, with these funds as well. Um, once they identify that there, are, there is no alternative payer source for either goods or services, they um, submit a form. It's a pretty short, sweet form that just identifies um, the adult and their needs. Um, and then it just lists uh, any other resources that have been attempted um, to alleviate some of the safety and risk issues. And then it also identifies who the vendor is going to be um, and how much the services are gonna cost. We set a primary or we set a limit of $2,500 right off the bat um, for each client for each fiscal year because we are going to continue this through our ARPA funds as well. Um, but we did advise staff that they could still submit higher ones um, if necessary to see if there were funds available. Um, we would go ahead and purchase or pay for those as well. Once um, it is approved, it's sent on to our community action agency and they do a pretty good job at turning that around pretty quickly and um, they actually hired a specific person who, to do this for us um, so that way it would be a pretty quick turnaround um, if it's for instance if they needed some things that could be purchased on amazon and um, they would go ahead and order them on amazon immediately with the use of a credit card um, if it required a check they would send the check out usually within a week or two um, we also uh, were paying for some emergency stays at hotels 
and they were able to go ahead and contact the hotel and use that credit card pretty quickly to get that set up without having to wait, especially on a Friday afternoon. We all know the emergencies tend to come in then. Um, but once those services are paid, our community action sends me a bill every single month um, and lets me know what all services have been paid so we can just verify that um, we're all on the same page and then they get paid. Um, we did set that all um, payments have to be done during an active case. Um, so that means um, for our investigations are typically 45 days and our general adult services um, referrals can go up to 60 days and with extensions if necessary. So we've asked our workers to pay attention. Um, we've paid for all kinds of things. Um, one of the items that I think was pretty cool, we managed to pay for somebody to get a car um, it was not a new car by any means, but we paid for the whole thing because they were able to sit down and work out a budget and figured out that the budget for paying for transportation for them was going to be extremely high compared to just paying for the car and then them supporting themselves through oil changes, insurance, licensing, all of that stuff. Um, because of course this person, it was doctor's visits out of state, so Medicaid wouldn't pay for that transportation to and from, um, so there were some barriers. Um, but we paid for extermination services, um, fixes of um, housing issues, uh, paying electric bills and things like that. Obviously those would go through LIHE first, um, but we've been pretty successful and um, our workers have expressed gratitude and being able to access these services for the adults to make sure that they can continue to live in the, the least restrictive environment for as long as possible. Thanks, Cliff. And I think uh, everybody in APS knows Friday at four o'clock or five o'clock or six o'clock is just like clockwork when the emergencies happen. So I'm not surprised to, to hear you say that at all. Um, all right, I think we'll go to our next question. Uh, so any lessons learned that you want to share with others? This is a real simple one, but there's probably a lot to say. Any lessons learned that you want to share with uh, other folks in the audience? Tim. Oh, Tim, we're having some I trouble. To turn to my, yeah, I might need to turn my mic on. That might help. There you are. Yep. All right. So um, first off, uh, and this is a, a, a duh realization, but communication is always important and input from everyone is vital. Um, for the entire life of the program, um, we have held regular meetings, sometimes weekly, with all of the AAAs to share information about the program, address issues, get input on processes, and to level set everyone. Uh, in fact, we're still, you know, uh, while we're flying the plane in the air, we're still making repairs to it. Uh, we recently um, had to to shift and, and, and change our invoicing. And uh, uh, so we do that, of course, with the input of all the AAAs so that everyone has kind of buy in on that and knows what we're doing and uh, can help to, to put that into motion. So um, so it's important to get that input from everyone. Uh, we purposefully use the word partnership as much as we possibly can in regards to this project because it truly is a partnership between APS and the AAAs to address client needs. We at APS just couldn't get this assistance to our clients without the help of the AAAs. Um, another uh, thing that we learned, and sounds like Cliff didn't have this issue as much as we did, but Contracts take a long time to establish, uh, especially when other units in your department are also receiving federal funding and are also pursuing contracts. Uh, it can cause a log jam with your procurement and contracting folks. So uh, we definitely ran into that with this program. Um, we, had a stat we had to establish 10 different contracts with all 10 of the uh, different AAAs as well as one contract with the um, uh, administrative agency, the Missouri Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Um, and uh, it, it, it delayed us for months, but needless to say, because of all of the delays, uh, it took a while to finalize those contracts, but after several months, we were able to get started with the program. 
Um, another thing that we uh, ran into, and we knew this was going to be an issue before we got going, was needing to reallocate funding between the or, or amongst the 10 AAAs. Uh, when we started this program, we had to, to take our huge, you know, Carissa funding pot and the amount of money that we were going to use for this program, we had to divide it up into 10 uh, different areas for the 10 different AAAs. We, we did that you know, based on the number of uh, reports of, of abuse, neglect, and exploitation we received in their, their uh, respective geographic areas. Uh, and then we kind of allotted the funds based on, on, um, uh, based on those percentages. So, uh, but one thing that we ran into was one of the AAAs spending their money down a lot quicker than some of the other AAAs. And that can be for a number of reasons. It could be that we have really overactive APS uh, specialists uh, in that area that are putting a lot of referrals through. Um, it may just be that uh, the, a particular area just has more needs than others or has lesser resources. But, um, but anyway, it all led to us needing to adjust the amounts between the 10 different contracts uh, so that each of the AAAs would have the inadequate amount of money uh, to be able to do what we're trying to get them to do. Another challenge is data collection and invoicing. Um, those are struggles. We could definitely benefit from a more sophisticated data tracking and expense tracking system uh, because currently we're using a lot of manual processes. Uh, due to a lack of interoperability between uh, platforms and the separation of tracking for finances and for goods and services, um, our staff that are running this program are stretched to full capacity to track all of these important things. So additional staffing resources would definitely be beneficial, or like I said, more sophisticated, more sophisticated tracking systems uh, to help. Um, another challenge uh, is being able to show in the impact of interventions before and after, given the technology platform limitations that we have. Our case management system is separate from the system that we use for this direct services program. Um, and our APS case management system just happens to be a little bit antiquated as well. Um, so we're having some challenges in comparing the impact of interventions. Um, another challenge that the AAAs ran into was availability of resources in rural areas is more of a struggle than in urban areas. And I'm not talking about the, the availability of community resources to help clients. I'm talking about the availability of just resources to get things done, the availability of, of contractors to do certain kinds of work, the availability of certain goods, certain services, things like that. Um, and so one idea that the, the AAAs had considered doing was uh, looking at something that statewide all of them need and potentially pursuing a contract, one contract with an agency that can provide services statewide. Uh, for instance, they had found a, uh, a pest control agency that would be willing to provide services across the state of Missouri. And so they were considering on having their association contract with that pest control agency so that all of the AAAs could have access to using that particular contractor to uh, do those bed bug treatments and all those other things that are so costly. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that small investments of funding can have a significant impact on the quality of life of our clients. And we've heard plenty of stories about the tremendous impact that our, our that this program has had in regards to improving the quality of our clients' lives. And we're really proud of that. So, so I'll turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you, Tim. I think Cliff is up next. So in Kentucky, um, since we did have a contract with one specific um, community action agency that has been wonderful, um, they track the funding for us to be able to tell us when we're about how, or um, they even break it down into ages for us. And um, so they were really great on handling that. And one of the issues that we've had is, is the vendor piece. Um, in some parts of our state, it's completely rural and there are very limited um, vendors 
our service providers who are willing to serve that community. So it's made it extremely difficult because we are not the ones who are out there looking for them. We have asked that the adult um, identify who they would like to use. So that way we're not swaying anybody's opinion and trying to send business to specific people. Um, so that has caused some dilemmas and of course staff have assisted in making phone calls and doing things like that. But we just have strongly advised them to um, let the adult make the decision themselves on who they want to have doing those services. Um, in that regard, we have also learned that some of these vendors, once they realize that the state is paying for these services, they have altered their bills to increase them, um, expecting us to be willing to pay more money. Um, and so we've had to have conversations about that we cannot pay that amount. And so then we just have to deny that specific vendor and move on to the next one, which then delays the goods and services even longer. We've also had um, considerable issues with Walmart because um, we were trying to do some purchases through them because they tend to be the least expensive provider. Um, so that is why we had to go through Amazon for a lot of stuff because Walmart is not as easy to return things and to dispute um, issues because just like Amazon, if you order on Walmart, some of that stuff does not come directly from Walmart. It comes from third party vendors and that just makes things much more difficult. Um, another piece that we had is, is with um, some of our workers. Unfortunately, um, when what they believe was communicated to them was that this is just free money that any adult can have access to. Um, and if they go out to a house and they feel that the adult may need some things um, that are not related to the safety and risk issues that we're out there for in the first place, that they just would go ahead and request them. Um, so for instance, if someone was short on clothes, um, they had ample clothes, but they just would like to have a little bit more. So that way maybe they don't have to do laundry as frequently. Um, they would submit requests for those um, items to be purchased. And so we had to go back and say, well, this isn't a want item. This is really some, this money is to address specific needs that are related to those safety and risk. Um, we also had to push back on some uh, items that uh, like name brand items that are extremely expensive um, that were wants because that's how they wanted to um, wanted to dress and so we had to discuss again that that that's not something that we're able to do at this time we need to be more realistic so we can be able to use this money for more people uh, we also have had issues. We experienced um, some major flooding in this past year in part of our state and some of our vendors that we were utilizing for that um, needed the money and so it became extremely difficult to get the money back from them because they were not able to produce the items that they said and so we were trying to fix that. Um, so sometimes it gets very difficult to work with vendors as well. Um, but and we also agree tracking outcomes is huge. Um, we want to be able to sell this to our legislature to say that we need this funding on a, a more regular basis. Um, and so we're trying our best to track what is being spent out and what it's for, um, but we don't have any follow-up mechanisms once a case is closed um, to be able to see exactly how long-term that is. Um, we can track and see if another case comes in and have a conversation with them to see if that really did help with whatever we were intending the funds to be used for um, and if maybe something else has come up. Um, so that is a, a dilemma that we have identified and we're trying to figure out ways to fix it but it is extremely difficult when we don't have the legal authority to be able to do those follow-ups to see how it's going um, so a lot of our um, stories are going to be anecdotal stories that maybe somebody's ran into so and so out in public and they shared how wonderful it was for them um, and The last one has slipped my mind. It just had popped up and now it has slipped my mind. So I believe those are the main lessons that we've learned in, in trying to work, move forward with this is just um, keeping track of those outcomes is hugely important. And uh, like Tim said, having those conversations and communicating things. And um, we did at the beginning of the funding stream, we did 
slowly start to see reports. It took a good four to five months to finally convince workers that this, this money is sticking around. We're going to have it for at least three years, so we need to start using it. Um, so it took a long time for APS workers to want to start accessing the funds, but then once they did, they realized how easy it was to use the money and how quickly the turnaround was. Um, so it benefited the clients pretty quickly. And so they started using that. And so unfortunately now we have to be a little more stringent on it to make sure that we don't overspend and run out of funds. Thanks, Cliff. That's a great list of, of challenges. Um, Mary, anything you'd like to say for this last question? Oh, sure. We've um, we've had a lot of lessons learned here. Um, I I think that uh, starting at the top, you know, receiving the funding was phenomenal. It was just incredible to to us here in Rhode Island. We we had almost no funding for APS, so we had like big ideas. Um, and um, but when you work for a state agency, there is bureaucracy that's uh, involved. So getting the funding, um, doing the contracts, um, it w it was difficult because it, we would first have to go through our office of management and budget, who would say, well, why do your clients need, uh, why do they need like um, nutrition? or um, a food voucher or um, a gift card to stop and shop. Can't they just like go to a restaurant or can't they just like get on the Meals on Wheels list? So we had to try to, first we had to educate on, <clears throat> on folks about that APS clients are a little bit different, right? They're not your average run of the mill kind of folks who are very independent and go out and get things that they need or, or pay for things that they need. So there was a lot of education involved in that. And when we made it past that level, um, we came to the contracting level. Um, <clears throat> the contracts had to be written. They had to be approved through um, several different layers, layers of state government, and then eventually sent to the vendor for their approval signature back to us get a purchase order, give them the purchase order, then they can start invoicing. So it is a, it was a long process, right? Um, but I think that that's, that really started with SIRSA. When, it, when we got to ARPA, things seemed a little bit easier at that point. Um, so there were a lot of lessons learned about the bureaucratic layers. Here's a pot of money for your APS clients, but it seemed like there were a lot of things that were barriers to us actually getting the money to our clients. Um, the other thing we learned is that some of the goods and services that we identified, some of the enhancements to our emergency respite program and to our safe shelter program um, really revolved around dealing with licensed care providers, um, whether it be a home care agency, an adult daycare center, um, a nursing home, a skilled nursing facility. A lot of these licensed care agencies were really, they were limited in either accepting people on, let's say, into a skilled nursing facility or being able to provide services in the community to, due to the pandemic, the long lasting impact of the pandemic. It just it just, you know, it, it went on for a lot longer than anybody obviously had anticipated. Um, we had guidelines that we had to follow here in the state of Rhode Island from our Department of Health. And so um, even though we enhanced our emergency respite, safe shelter services, then we ran up against, well, the nursing facilities are not accepting people, right? Because of the, of the COVID, because of the pandemic. Um, so we had to do some like um, tweaking of that. And so we had to work with our vendor in our safe shelter program to say, hey, maybe you don't just um, provide safe shelter, maybe you do some community outreach to folks um, and educate them on, on how to, how to um, prevent um, you know, health and safety risks in the future, offer whatever services they have available, um, so we had to kind of tweak those things and really meet the client where they were because 
even though we, are in, we wanted to enhance their ability to live independently in the community, there were circumstances that maybe they needed to go somewhere to get some services. Um, so we kind of learned that um, the hard way. And I think the goods and services really um, helped our clients with um, independence in the community. Um, the other thing I want to say too is, yeah, we've struggled with data collection from our vendors. Um, we don't have a data system that can really capture this information. Um, so we are relying on their reporting and um, it is a struggle. Um, you know, so that's something else that we're facing as well. Um, and the other thing I want to say too is um, it's all, you know, it's all about the client. Um, but we said, hey, like this is a great opportunity to, to enhance our, our APS staff, right? Uh, we've had the same number of APS staff for as long as I can remember. And of course our cases are, you know, they're climbing just like every other state. Um, but, you know, that's another lesson learned that it's not, the bureaucracy says, hey, you've got great funding, but the thing is, is that funding source is gonna run out and then what are you gonna do? How are you gonna pay this workforce after the funding source runs out? Um, and so we're kind of struggling with that as well. So that's a, a really big lesson that we learned as well. Um, and I think that's everything I can think of at this particular time. Great, thank you, Mary. Um, we've heard from several states that, you know, um, hiring has been an issue because it's not permanent funding, it's temporary funding, and it's been hard to do that. So, yeah, thanks to all of our panelists for all the answers to that questions. We've got about eight minutes left, and we do have some questions I will throw. Most of these are not for anyone in particular. I'll kind of throw them out, um, and anybody can respond to them who wants to, as easy to, to say to them. Um, the first one is, how do the adult services of other state agencies fit into the funding referral services. So um, what's the role, is there a role for other state agencies in these services that you provide? Um, and if so, what is it? And these would be um, service or departments like the Department of Mental Health, Department of Developmental Disabilities, et cetera. Anybody have anything to comment on that? And, and maybe you haven't involved other state agencies, so. Uh, in Missouri, we uh, the, we haven't involved other state agencies. Um, the, you have to be an APS client in order to receive uh, services through this program. So uh, basically, if we run across anyone uh, that, that is wondering how to uh, get their client some services through this program, we, we start to ask them, well, are, are, are they enduring any kind of abuse, neglect, or exploitation? And if so, we encourage them to make a report to our, our hotline uh, so that they can, um, so we can screen them and potentially uh, look at them for this program. Excellent. Uh, yeah, we, Rhode Island did not really, uh, we didn't involve other state agencies as on, you know, as our partners here, obviously they, they do become involved at some point, but um, our vendors or our community agencies who are really our grassroots level kind of folks who are actually seeing these people. And they, and um, as Tim said, they have to be APS clients. They can't be somebody on, on long-term services and supports who, you know, maybe wants to get a certain good or service. It strictly has to be for APS. Thanks, Mary. In Kentucky, we also did not partner with any agencies. Sure. All right. Um, another question, and I expect I know the answer to this one, but this is uh, probably for all of you. Uh, were you able to access the federal funding immediately, or did you have to wait an amount of time to draw down the funds? Is there an amount of time between when it was awarded and when you could actually start using them that was a barrier for you? Well, I'll go first. We uh, contracting slowed us down tremendously. Um, months and months and months of of waiting on contracts to get approved um, really got in our way. Um, we did um, waste a little bit of time uh, before that, just trying to figure out what to do and how to how to structure it. Um, like Cliff, we considered the community action agencies as you know potential partners for this program, but ultimately decided that. Uh, AAAs uh, gave us a better uh, partner to pursue it. But 
but yeah, uh, uh, took us a, a bunch of extra time because of that contracting process. Sure. Came in Rhode Island, definitely. Okay. And I think in Kentucky, it went, we started as quickly as we could. We were very lucky because the community action already had a contract, so we just modified that. Yeah. So that sped things up extremely, um, made it much faster. But I don't imagine, if I'm understanding the correct question correctly, our drawdown of the funds from the feds, I don't think Kentucky was in any hurry to draw down the funds because we got pushed by the feds to say, why haven't you all drawn down any funds yet? And this was after we had already spent quite a bit of money. So not sure on the fiscal side why they waited, but we were moving forward. I know some states had a barrier. They had to get their legislator to legislation to approve legislators to approve the money before they could draw it down. That may be where that's coming from. Thanks so much. Um, here's another question for any of you who might have been using hotels for respite stays or emergency placement. Um, in the decision making to use the hotel, was there any discussion or concerns around liability in doing so as far as damage to the hotel or motel or uh, the facility? Or are you just careful about who you place in the facility because of that? Right. I mean, I don't think we we thought that far out. I think we just thought like, what is good for the client, on, and not thought about the liability. But I will say that the hotel or motel stays that we have been able to um, provide to our clients, we've never had an issue say that. Knock on wood. Right. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on that one? And in Kentucky, we didn't really consider that either, but I will also say that I'm going to, based on the ones that I have seen that we paid for, I don't imagine that those hotels are all that worried about damage to their property. Mm. Um, because again, the clients, they get to pick where they want to stay at. And so they do not usually pick the Marriott and the Hiltons and all that stuff. So, mm. okay. All right, we'll move it on to our next question. And I've, you've all kind of alluded to this. Um, does anyone have a good model on how to measure the impact of intervention before and after providing client services? And this is tricky for APS because they don't follow clients usually long term. But has anyone found um, any method that works for that? Still working on it. We are too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, trying to crack that code. Yep. Right. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, uh, well, I think we'll do one more question and then we'll wrap things up. Um, does anyone have a number um, of people that reside in rural rural areas where providers are unavailable? Are you tracking any um, numbers of clients where they may be in a rural area where there are no services at all? So technically speaking, Rhode Island does not have any rural areas, according to the federal government. So we are not. Thanks, Mary. So we track in Kentucky by counties and regions, um, so that way we know exactly what's going on. Um, so we haven't specifically pulled out the, the counties that we know have limited services yet. Um, I think we were just kind of gathering all the data so that way we could look at it once the project was over. Sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. This is, uh, my hope is that this project will help us to identify what, you know where those areas are in the state that are are deficient in in resources, community resources and resources otherwise. Sure. Um, yeah. Because in most states, the areas of the state are very different. You know, rural and urban. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we'll move on to our final slide. Thanks um, so much to to Cliff, Tim, and Mary and Jennifer Curtin um, for providing providing all this information today. It was a great discussion great to hear in action, you know, um, how this works and some of the issues that you've had, some of the barriers that you've had. Because other states have had barriers too, and now they can feel like they're not alone with that. So um, you have our contact information on this slide. You can reach out to us, any of our social media outlets, or using the email address apstart-ta at acl.hhs.gov. We would love to hear from you. 
please fill out your evaluation, which will pop up as soon as we close the webinar. And you'll also receive it in a follow-up email about 24 hours from now. We'd appreciate it if you um, click on it then if you don't fill it out right now. Again, thanks so much to our presenters today, and we will see everybody next month on another APS Dark webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you.